Hi everyone at AOE U and who's following this chat today. I am so excited that we are going to be having a conversation about choice-based art education with one of my favorite people, Janet Taylor. She just joined and hopefully as you're coming on, um, go ahead and drop uh, Janet join us. Um, as you're joining the chat, go ahead and give us a wave and tell us where you're, hey Janet. Hey. Um, where you're tuning in from. If you're just joining the chat, let us know where you're tuning in from and um, how you define choice in your art room to yourself throughout the chat. Um, um, Janet just joined us. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited um, that we are here today to talk about kind of the umbrella topic of let's talk about some of the myths of what is called choice-based art education. And we have one of my favorite people and art teachers and experts on the topic, Janet Taylor, with us. Um, before I introduce her, um, my name is Megan Daner. I am the senior editor of the AOEU magazine, and I get, have the pleasure of working with people like Janet to put content out to all of you and to help to support you in your classroom. So, can't wait to get started today. Um, throughout our chat, I have a feeling it's going to go a little bit longer than normal because Dan and I can talk for a while, while right? But um, as you're watching, go ahead and pose us questions. Let us know what you're thinking and if you have any feedback and anything that we talk about today. So, Janet, hi. Go ahead and introduce yourself to um, everyone and we can get some questions going and talking. I can't wait. All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Janet Taylor. Um, I am a high school art teacher, 9 through 12, and I teach in the western suburbs of Chicago. Um, and I'm a choice-based art teacher. Um, what can I tell you? I guess a little bit about um, my past experience. I um, taught in, uh, I actually was a scenic artist for a long time, about 10 years, and then I traveled into uh, education I taught in Chicago public schools for a couple of years and then um, transitioned to the school I'm at now. Um, and that's kind of when all of the transition to choice happened. Okay. Um, and I'm currently a writer, as Megan um, knows, right, or has mentioned, that I'm a writer for Art of Ed. So you can see a lot of articles on there um, that I've written about, a lot of them about choice. Um, and I've done a couple pro packs, um, one about choice in the high school setting. Shocking, I know. And then uh, two of them with my um, really good friend, Matt Melkowski. Awesome. And um, you've also helped out on some of our webinars, too, that we oh, had yes. on the onset of COVID. It seems like a lifetime ago, right? It does. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, well, before we get into some of the questions I have for Janet, I am going to drop in the chat um, one of Janet's, uh, my favorite articles of hers, where she talks about the uh, myths of choice, um, that kind of are the preconceived uh, notion. So um, one thing that I know that was on my mind for a really long time and also a lot of our readers is, so first and foremost, Janet, what is the difference between tab and choice-based? And is there a difference? Um, and what should be kind of understood about them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think when I started my journey, I didn't understand that either. And it's kind of hard to kind of sift through that information. Um, so I get that question a lot. So TAB, if you're not familiar, is Teaching for Artistic Behavior. Um, and that is, um, it was developed by Catherine Douglas and um, Diane Jackwith and a bunch of other um, amazing people who um, basically develop this pedagogy. And the pedagogy behind TAB, or Teaching for Artistic Behavior, is that it is very student-directed. Um, the student is the artist, so it's like a philosophical kind of umbrella. Student is the artist, and their uh, classroom is the studio. And um, choice, <laughs> a lot of times people think that they are not, not doing choice, not providing choice, okay. or they think um, they assimilate choice and TAB as the same. And TAB is like that overarching umbrella of pedagogy and choice is one method or methodology that you could deliver instruction to okay. support your students. So what I, um, I teach TAB um, from that philosophical place, but um, I call myself a choice-based art teacher because that is typically the methodologies that I 
um, am so passionate about in explaining. Okay. So what I love about choice um, is that it's a choice continuum, is the, this kind of linear, I guess, way you want to look at it, um, that on one end of the spectrum, you have teacher-directed um, projects or right. instructions, right? And on the other end of the uh, spectrum, you have artwork, where it's very student directed, right? Totally on their own. Um, and the choice continuum, the way that works, and you might have a bunch of different methodologies in between, like right. uh, STEAM or design right. thinking, um, right. you know, Project whatever, right? Yeah. And then based on your students' needs, you kind of go back and forth across that choice continuum, that spectrum, right. to deliver instruction uh, based on the values that you have. So if you are somebody who believes that your students are the artist and their art room is, or the classroom is their art room, and you have that tab pedagogy mindset, sure. then you will decide how you deliver that instruction to get your students to that point where they can take that on on their own. Okay. Um, so I think that is one of the biggest uh, myths about there, misunderstandings, right? Is right. that um, if I'm just a tab, if I'm a tab teacher, or if I'm, um, Oh, how am I explaining this? Let's see. So if, if I say, directed. yeah, so if I'm, if I say, um, I'm a choice teacher, a lot of times people think of tab is what they think it is. Oh and really what's happening in, in teacher directed, you're still giving some amount of choice, right? It's not, you know, we think of those cookie cutter projects. Those are building confidence and building skills. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Right. Um, it's just one end of the spectrum. Students still right. have some choice. The idea is to try to get them to a place where they are fully directed on their own. Does right. that make sense? And it, yes. And so every art teacher shouldn't think of themselves as either the black or white of tab choice or the other end of the spectrum. It's more like we're all gray and we find ourselves, we're all, we understand value, right? We're all gray and we understand where we put ourselves. Um, and it's a lot of it's based on our students and it's very highly individualized to where our students are at to what the environment we're teaching in and the type of values we have as a teacher. So why yes. is it kind of a hot button issue among our teachers, right? We get pretty fired up about kind of the terminology sometimes and then also the philosophy. Why do you think it's always so spicy? Oh my gosh. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so true though, right? It's like so polarizing. Um, it's really interesting. So Matt Malkowski, as I mentioned, and I had done a, a ProPAC. We talked about this specific yeah. thing about balancing your curriculum. And um, we've spoken about this a lot. Um, years ago, when I went into, moved into Choice, sure. um, we started having these conversations about, like, why do we go to conferences, you know, and people, or we're hearing things on Facebook or wherever, right, social media, right. where teachers are like, well, no cookie cutter projects and you, I can't believe you're doing that or, you know, or, oh my gosh, tab is like a free for all. And like, actually none of that is true. Right. Um, I think it's just that we are so passionate about making sure that we're delivering curriculum and supporting our students the best we can, right. that we get like so excited about the direction that we're going. Right. And as teachers, we think we're always doing what's best for our students. We hope to, Right. And what I would love to kind of demystify a little bit is this idea that um, one way is the only way. Because a lot of times, I mean, that's the thing, right? T tab is like a, that umbrella, but choice is one way to deliver that curriculum. And we often use choice or may maybe use, at least I do, right? I use design thinking. I use all sorts of different pieces to make up my curriculum to meet my kids where they are. So if you sit there and say, no, this is the only way, I feel like you're really missing out on an opportunity to be reflective and acknowledge your students' needs where they are. Right, right. And growing is hard. And <laughs> so hard. And <laughs> be asked to think about a different way when you've already worked so hard to get where you are and have the philosophy that you do. It's, can be really intimidating. So it's a very natural reaction to be guarded. Um, so as you kind of, you mentioned a couple of years ago, you approached a more choice-based curriculum. What was your journey towards that? What did that look and feel like? Yeah. So um, 
I would say my big shift was, um, so basically when I was teaching in Chicago public schools, um, my Matt and a couple other, my colleagues, um, Elizabeth Osborne and I, we had spent a lot of time developing, like you said, like that curriculum, it's like super rich. And you're like, I got this. This is my curriculum. Um, and, uh, my family grew, I moved out of the city. I had to move to another school. And when I got to that school, um, I was delivering the same curriculum, which is outstanding, right? It's super exciting. Um, and I think what happened was I started to feel more comfortable in who I was as a teacher. And so, and like the management of everything. Um, so I was starting to be a little bit more reflective on, um, am I, servicing my students in what they need um, right. right now, right? And, and mm-hmm. different students, different schools, different classes even have different needs, right? right. So um, even you could have a, like a drawing one, you know, second period and then drawing one eighth period and they have drastically totally different, different right. needs, right? So um, trying to make sure we're meeting the students where they are. And I, I started going like, hmm, I feel like something's missing here and I'm not really sure what it is. And I started teaching AP and I started going, what is happening here? So my students were asking all sorts of questions like, well, I've never had to think before, or I I don't know how to ask that question, or they would um, not really always understand the difference between inspiration and plagiarism, right? (laughs) Or like, you know, taking somebody, they would go on to Pinterest and kind of regurgitate that because, you know, and and there's a place for that too, of like learning skills that way, right? Um, But when you come to AP, we want our students to be really um, deep thinkers. We want them to be critical thinkers. And and I want to service my kids that when they leave school or they leave my class, even if it's a level one class, and that's the only one they take, I want to make sure that I'm providing them with some solid life skills to be critical thinkers, right? Right. Um, so that was kind of a piece to it. And I thought, mm, what do I do with this? This is bothering me. And I went to um, NAEA, I think it was maybe um, New Orleans that I went to. Okay. And I saw a presentation where uh, a middle school teacher was talking about the choice continuum. And I was like, what is this? And he was using it as like a diagnostic tool for your lessons, which was pretty awesome too, to like see where you fit on there and oh, okay. when you deliver certain lessons. Yeah. Um, but I think it was like this perfect storm where I was kind of like, what's going on? And this seems to work and I'm going to try this out. Um, and thankfully um, I have very supportive administration in the fact that they kind of let me kind of do that, go rogue a little bit, right? I'm like, I really want to try this out. And I tried it with one class. And I think a lot of times um, people kind of go all in, you know, and that's like super overwhelming. And if you watch my pro pack, you'll be like, what is happening? There's so much here. Like you do not have to do this overnight, right? I I did it one class at a time and I tried to kind of figure out what was working. Is it going in the directions that I want it to go, et cetera. And I think that is uh, kind of the, the bulk of my story in a nutshell. And so now after you kind of had a little transformation and you said you had really supportive administration, I saw in the chat, someone said that her administration seems, she has a hard time convincing them Mm. that it's not doing nothing. Um, And I think that's one of the biggest myths or misconceptions with maybe a more choice-based approach. And so you were lucky you had someone in your corner, but what would you say is, if that's the biggest misconception, how would you provide evidence otherwise? Right. So, um, so there's two things. Okay. So the first thing with my journey, um, because again, just because I was supported to try this out didn't mean that I was convincing people that it was like actually yourself. going to work, right? Right. Um, so being able to do it and show how uh, the results, I think, was a huge game changer for um, 
my administration, but also my department, right? My other teachers in my department were like, okay, Janet, like we're off your rocker. And so when I actually showed them like, Hey, look at what's happening. And they're like, you know, that's not so bad. And then that started kind of steamrolling a conversation with my department. And then, our, you know, we ended up talking about the creative process and how important process is and how that drives product. So I think that's the other thing is that you always hear product, product, product. Right. And, you know, we all know that it doesn't, it's not like I just, snap my fingers and there's like a masterpiece, right? right? It takes a lot of time and, and, you know, work. And so I think, um, you know, we started developing that, uh, framework from our level ones and that's been a game changer for our department to show the community kind of what we're doing. Now, if you're starting on like, okay, I just want to try to sell this so I can even make that step in the first place. Um, I would say the first thing is that the national standards completely align with the tab or, or choice methodologies. Um, so when you're talking about that, um, it's actually very easy because it's very student directed. I would also say that a huge chunk of this um, that I would promote is that when uh, I was observed for evaluations, you know, um, people would come in, administrators would come in and be like, what is happening here? And they could ask a student at any point, what are you doing? Doing, why are you doing it? And because it's so um, student centered and student directed, they are, um, you know, spouting off all this stuff. And the administration's like, hey, that's actually like, you know, excellent rating or whatever, because right. depending on what framework or whatever you use, but it's student focus. Students are driving it and they're the ones thinking and you're just guiding them. And so I think, you know, I understand that there's a piece to like, you have to get your foot in the door in the first place to sell it. But I would start with the standards and be like, this is what it is. And we're talking about critical thinking skills. Um, 21st century skills, I think right. is a big one. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then, and then once you get it going, you know, I think mm -hmm. showing that evidence of learning, that is a huge component that um, demonstrates to both administration and to the community, what you're doing and how that's working. Sure. And as, like, what has been your experience with student buy-in? So there is obviously administration, and that's part of it. But students who, and we all know that students have all sorts of different experiences in art. From elementary, middle, and high school, they're sometimes not consistent at all. Mm -hmm. And so having students enter into your classroom with maybe a different approach than they've ever seen before or experienced or been approached with, what is your, what has been your experience or how do you explain to students and what buys them in? So um, first of all, I would say the biggest, uh, so first of all, I, I, from day one, I tell my students that we're in this together and we're figuring this out and things will adjust as we go. And I think just knowing that they're part of that process and take ownership of that, mm -hmm. they right then and there, you've got buy-in from them, right? Sure. The other piece is um, the, the obstacles that come up with students that I have found and continue to still see is that uh, we are so used to telling our students what to do that they really struggle when you tell them, I don't, I don't have the answer for like what, I don't know. What do you think you should do? Um, they get really angry actually about that and frustrated. And um, it's amazing though, over a semester, for example, to see that growth in them to start to understand, oh, right. This isn't going to, um, there is no right or wrong. I don't have to compare against my peers because I'm making something that is personal and interesting to me. Right. And so through that process, they take that ownership and it happens. It might take a little bit um, of constant modeling. You know, I think modeling is a huge piece of that as it is with any teaching practice, right? Um, but getting them to understand that we're going to build these skills and we're going to start slow. But, um, oh, so along that same line, you had asked me like, what um, the biggest myth is like, it's kind of like a free for all. And that right. kind of goes part of it, right? Is that students need structure. You can't just walk in on day one and, ha and say to students, okay, here's crayons and here's, uh, right. you know, oil paints and here, what, what, whatever, go make an artwork. Like that's not going to work either. And they are going to right. be flooded and freak right. out and not what to do. Right. It's like giving them a piece of white paper and saying, go. And they're like, I don't know. You know, right. there's like a couple kids that will always know what to do. Right. Right. Um, 
But alongside that, the buy-in is, is building that confidence with the students also to know um, that that you're not just going to let them completely fail um, on day one, right? So right. building those skills, building that confidence, and, and that's the piece of the free-for-all that is not true, right? My classroom is like so structured and highly orchestrated, really. It's like, you know, boo, 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 puppetry, right? right? Magic. And um, because of that, as I move forward, I'm building those foundational skills, whether that's in technical or conceptual thinking, so that they can make multiple artworks then making choices and feel good about the choices that they're making and say, I, I can. I think that's a, the, so empowering, right? It's like telling students for them to be able to say, I can make choices. I think that's like number one, right? It is. And how empowering and uplifting for you as the teacher to then be actually doing what you want to be doing, um, empowering your students. And I would say like, that is also a big shift in teacher. Like that's not easy either to let go of that. Um, to let go of the fact that it's not going to necessarily be what I expect it to be um, or I want it, you know, well, I had these instructions and this is what it should look like to be able to um, let go of the, the, what do you, um, that ownership as a teacher or that responsibility. There's a little bit of ego in all of us, right? Yes. We, I mean, we've, we've dedicated our lives to this, right? So of course there's this piece of us that, is hard to let go of. And I just want to, there's someone in the chat asked if this is recorded to watch again. The answer is yes, it'll be on Instagram live TV for 24 hours and then it will be on our AOEU uh, YouTube channel. So you'll see Janet and I forever if you'd like. Um, but <laughs> what's really cool about this topic is that it's relevant in our crazy time of different models of learning virtual in-person or hybrid, this choice-based approach or where you could start to maybe experiment with a different approach. Um, and it will stay relevant uh, given the standards and how AP, Janet's also an expert in um, kind of facilitating AP and those different frameworks and those changes. So the idea that we can empower our students to as long as we're willing to try something, even just a little thing, a little bit different, which is what we do anyway, all the time. Yeah. We're just calling it something different sometimes. Right. And I think that's, I, th I think that is the, the key component you mentioned, because I think a lot of times we're like, oh, if I go to choice or tab or whatever, it's like all or nothing. And again, no, you can take your time. You can add little bits of choice. Like, like you said, now it's actually like, so important, right? It's, it's uh, social emotional learning right there. You're addressing right. students' interests and needs and, and their emotional states. Um, but it doesn't have to be. And I wouldn't suggest you do that. Like we're like, okay, I'm just going to give it all. I'm going to change everything up all of a sudden. Right. You can't do that either. Students need um, transition. You need to work. It, it is, there's a lot of teaching nuances that we all know that there, we do kind of inherently. But even in changing in this direction or setting your st students up for success, and what I mean by success is not that they can't fail. I think that's another thing is shifting mindset of, you know, students, right? Is right. that it's okay to fail because that's where you're learning. And how right. are you going to take what you learned and do something better the next time? And I think right. just shifting all of these focuses and mindset is really what it's about. It's not, it's not about accepting lower quality work. It's not about less expectations. It's not a free for all. Um, it's just a shift in mindset so that what you're valuing is what you're teaching and modeling. Right. And at AOEU, we have a ton of resources, thanks to wonderful people like Janet, on uh, not only the magazine, but we have pro packs and our current flex curriculum really allows that continuum of being able to see something and say, oh, I think my classroom could use this regardless of um, where you find yourself on the spectrum of more teacher directed or student directed. Um, and so if that's something that any of you are interested in, please visit us. And um, if anyone has any further questions or wants to find Janet, um, I'll let her share her um, Instagram handle if she would like, or you can certainly find her at AWU. Um, 
it's um, what is your Instagram handle? I forget. So my personal one is oh. at uh, J A Taylor Art. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, I usually promote like things like this and yeah. also my kids, right? Sure. Like my own family stuff. Um, but you can also, if you're interested in seeing like my students work, um, it's just my whole department, um, uh, students work, obviously it's not mine. Right. Um, but at N N H S art, all one word N N H S art. Um, and that you can kind of scroll through and see what we're talking about there. Well, thank you, Janet, for joining this conversation. I think, once again, we've proved that art teachers are drawn to this conversation, either um, because they're already thinking about the philosophy of a more choice-based, or <clears throat> they're in it, and they want to even get better at it. And there's no arrival point. That's what I found interesting, is that there's no, like, oh, I'm now this kind of teacher. Like, no, you're trying something and it could be um, just to dip in the, you know, you're dipping your toes in. So I really appreciate you joining us and everyone who has watched. Thank you for participating and your comments. And we really appreciate you following. Next week, um, we get to talk to another one of our favorite people, Abby Shikai. She has joined and actually hosted some Instagram lives before, but she and I are going to be talking about our favorite articles ever. Oh, I can't wait. At the AOEU site because there's a lot. And um, some oldies but goodies are still so relevant, even though the educational landscape is so different than maybe it has been in the past few years. So I look forward to that. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. Have a, yep. Have a great rest <laughs> of the day, everybody. Bye. Bye.